All right, on today's episode of China Digger, I'm actually on my way to pick up a second machine. As you've already probably seen, I ordered a uh, gas digger first, and I already showcased that, and we have that. But almost at the same time as that, I also ordered from another company a diesel machine with a Kubota in it. Uh, just a, so I think it's just slightly larger. Um, we'll see when we really get it what it really is. But uh, people have asked me what is the process of ordering one of these machines and importing one of these machines. So while I'm on my way to go pick it up, I thought I'd give you a little rundown on that. So the first thing is not how to import it. I think the first big question is whether to import it at all. And uh, there's some good reasons not to. I, it's a hassle. It takes a long time. You don't get a look at it. You don't exactly know what you're getting. Um, the parts for it are all the way on the other side of the world. Uh, the communication is tricky. Uh, you're not supporting American-made products. Um, all those, those are great reasons not to do it. Um, and if those are driving factors for you, then don't. Um, the reason I did buy one is actually pretty simple. I have, this will be my fourth excavator. I was looking for a machine that was smaller and I was looking for a machine in a certain price point. So I'm not a commercial digger. I don't spend 30, 40 hours a week inside a machine digging for people. I need a machine for me, for the projects I do, for my own property, for my own business, but it's not an excavation business. And most of the time, my machine is not going to be in use. It's going to be in standby, ready to do work for me if I need it but not necessarily doing it every day. So I don't want to dump $30,000 into a little tiny cat machine. It would be great to buy American. Um, I'm driving a Chevy right now. I've got a Chevy truck. I'm driving my Chevy Traverse. Uh, buy American if you can. I believe in that. But when it comes to the price point and wanting one of these little excavators, I shopped used locally. I kind of looked at new machines, but not really, just out of my price point. Um, I had spent a lot of time on auction time, considering auction machines. I have bought some auction machines in the past. I've bought a couple tractors on auction. Uh, but it's a crapshoot, what you get. And you need to be ready to rebuild it and repair it, really, when you buy an auction machine. So your options for an economic excavator would be a local one that's got a lot of hours that's all used up if you're trying to be cheap. So, you know, you might be buying a Bobcat or a Tehuchi or something with, you know, 3,000, 4,000 hours on it for the price of what a little Chinese digger costs. Or you're going to be buying a gray market machine. Um, now, I've owned two gray market excavators and for the very reason of price point and value. So the first one was uh, Yanmar and the second one was Hitachi. Uh, the Yanmar was about a 6,000 pound excavator. The Itachi was uh, about a 35,000 pound excavator. And they were both gray market. Gray market not meaning illegal machines. Gray market simply means that they were imported, but not by a dealer. And they don't meet the original specifications for the US market, for admissions for the engine, for roll cable roll cage protection, that kind of thing. They're not illegal machines like black market machines would be. So a gray market machine is simply a machine that wasn't made for the U.S. market, but is now here in the U.S. market. Um, one of the challenges with that is parts are hard to find and that kind of thing. 
Uh, the Itachi machine I had was a 135, which I wasn't worried about parts for that because there actually is a comparable John Deere machine. Uh, essentially, there's a John Deere 135, which Hitachi made for John Deere. Uh, so much for patriotism right there. So really, um, it's just a different color paint. But uh, the John Deere is the Hitachi underneath it. Uh, with more expensive paint. <laughs> yep. So, the China Digger. That's how I decided to import the China Digger is ultimately the machines I was finding were either too used up, uh, gray market, and so I decided to go with a foreign digger. Now, if I were looking for a bigger machine, I think I would buy one that was used, like I am, or more locally, and not necessarily go with the Chinese model. I don't think I'd buy a 30,000 pound excavator from China. That in my mind doesn't as make as much sense. The little gas-powered excavator made sense to me because it felt workable. And that we could probably repair whatever we needed to repair on it. We could probably find all the parts we needed. It's got a little Briggs and Stratton. The one that's coming in today that we're picking up has has a Kubota engine in it. And I think we'd be able to find any things that we need for that. Hopefully we don't need anything of seriousness because they are new machines, so they're not like an old machine and everything's not already needing to be replaced. Okay, so you've decided that you're interested in the import. And you've gone through the options. How do you go about it? Step one is you get an Alibaba.com account. Uh, Alibaba is the place where you're going to want to go to communicate, shop, pay, set everything up. Um, what I did is I went on Alibaba, a first time Alibaba user, and I went and I found as many excavator sellers as I could find on there. I made a short list of what I was after, size machine, attachments, that kind of thing, and then I sent an inquiry to probably, I don't know, 10 different manufacturers plus, maybe more than that. And then uh, I waited for the inundation of responses. And I kind of started just opening a dialogue with all those different companies. Um, I asked about price parts was one of the things I used to kind of figure out whether who I wanted to go with. So um, would they immediately just give me a price for a final drive or a roller or a hydraulic rotator motor? Could I communicate with them what the part was and could they easily just send me a price back for it? Um, I figured if they could do that, then they were ready to send and sell me those parts if I should need them. Um, it also showed me how quickly and easily we were communicating. Um, a bunch of the manufacturers I didn't have a great time communicating with. Uh, we were unclear on what we were saying to each other. Uh, there was a lot of lag in getting messages back and forth. And so ultimately, the company I chose, I chose because not necessarily the price, but simply because the communication was going well. Um, and that's what I based my decision on. Well, I mean, there were a couple of things, but that was a major factor for me, the quality of the communication. So once I figured out what I wanted, and, and I will say right here, one of the things I really wanted with a tiny machine was attachments. Uh, I wanted a variety of size buckets. Uh, I wanted a brush rake. These were important things to me. And I came pretty close to buying a used Bobcat and I came pretty close to buying a used Takuchi locally. Both were worn out, all used up machines. The prices were reasonable though. Um, but one of the things that led me away from that is 
like an aftermarket brush rake for both of them was in the realm of a thousand dollars a tilting clean out bucket you know was 1500 to 2000 um, if they didn't have a thumb I was looking at another thousand to fifteen hundred to put a thumb on a mini that didn't have one so with the little china minis the price for buckets and attachments is is, is amazing um, you know the brush rate you're looking at another hundred 150 bucks for each thing versus another thousand for each thing on an American unit so that's kind of a game changer for me and one of the reasons I did decide to go to China it was not necessarily just the machine but for the extra stuff I could get with the machine all right so uh, you picked out all that stuff how do you buy it um, my research says you want to go through Alibaba you want an Alibaba order and you want a company that has Alibaba assurance then you want to pay for it through some sort of method that you have faith in also having uh, if you don't get anything then you can get your money back um, you, Alibaba assurance can also do an escrow where they hold funds and essentially it all gets paid out to the manufacturer once you receive the shipment now really that's just a shipment so they can send you anything all right so you've made your Alibaba order once that's placed what you're gonna do is you're gonna get your bill of sale and submit that to your broker and then essentially you're going to pay a bond with the broker and a broker free so they know that they're representing you and basically sign an agreement that they represent you and then you're going to wait for your machine to ship once shipping has been arranged by the manufacturer they will send out a bill of lading and the bill of lading um, needs to go to your customs broker once they have that and the bill of sale they'll start doing the customs paperwork. There's a customs submission and then a customs fee. You'll pay 25% in customs taxes for that fee. Uh, there's a couple other random fees as well. There's a import ISF fee, importer something, ISF fees. Uh, some sort of filing fee. Um, I don't know what it was. The customs broker just took care of it. Um, and with the customs broker, I paid them up front basically a bond fee to represent me. And I signed an agreement to represent me. But I didn't prepay them any of the customs fees or any of that. They actually paid those fees, the customs fees, the filing fees, and then sent me a bill for the total and I needed to wire them the funds for those fees. Um, all told on my little machine that came to about two grand. So with the customs filing fees and all that. That also included the shipping fee uh, which was about 700 and for freight, for the ocean freight. Uh, like I've said before the seller will say that they're paying the freight, but don't get confused by that. The manufacturer in China does not actually pay the ocean freight. They're only going to pay the freight to the ship in China. And then you're going to end up paying whatever the freight is for the uh, ship to get it to the United States. Probably another 700 bucks or so. Um, so all told, if you get uh, for the basic gas digger in China, plan another about two grand on top of whatever their price is um, for your budget. What happens is it'll come in off the boat into the port in a container, of course, and the containers will get sorted at the port. You don't have to deal with any of that. Um, and then it'll get moved somewhere inland to a transfer facility where crates usually get unpacked and where packages are going to meet semis at a loading dock like this. 
So then you find the door to go in and you give them your shipping invoice and then they load you up. It's pretty simple like that. But uh, you won't be at the port usually, you'll be at a transfer center. And all that information should come on your shipping invoice. Make sure you call them ahead of time. Make sure all the fees have been paid before you show up so you have no surprises. And uh, a lot of these places have lunch times too. So try to space out that you're not there during their lunch break or if they have large truck rush periods. So you should ask them about those details of what time of day to arrive and that kind of thing. And then you can pick it up and they'll run it out with a forklift.